Welcome everyone to uh, this edition of Precision Analysis Systems Tea Time uh, webinar. Um, on this special edition, um, you also have a ticket to join us for our Genetic Medicine Evolution Revolution Summit, um, and that will begin soon after this webinar. So please do um, join that uh, when we finish here. So today I'd like to welcome Dr. Florin Weber, um, who will be talking about uh, quantification of phospholipid-based drug delivery systems uh, where do we stand? Um, so as I mentioned, we have our summit today. Um, as we get through the webinar in the chat, we'll put the link to join the summit. So when you finish here, you can just simply click on the link and it will take you straight to the summit. We have session one, um, which will be discussing COVID-19 impact on vaccine RNA and genetic medicines revolution. Um, then we'll also be discussing partnering to build um, the genetic medicines for the future. And then we'll have an excellent um, keynote um, closing by Dr. Michael Houghton, who was a 2020 Nobel Prize winner. Um, and Dr. Houghton will be discussing the vaccine evolution. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll hand it over to um, Dr. Weber now. So. Thank you very much for the introduction. Today, I'm going to speak about the quantification of phospholipid-based drug delivery systems, and I would like to show you where do we stand at the moment. But before we jump directly into the topic, I would like to show you what we are going to talk about today. First, I would like to give a brief introduction. Then I would like to switch to possible approaches for the quantification of phospholipids. And last but not least, I would like to present you a new HPLC DAD cut based method for the analysis of phospholipid based drug delivery systems. Phospholipid based nanocarriers. What you see here is probably what you have in mind when you think the first time about liposomes or lipid nanoparticles. But what you see here is just a plain liposome, and this does not represent the complex mixtures that are on the market or currently under research. What is on the market? or currently under research is not only composed of one phospholipid, they're composed of different phospholipids with different um, lipid chains, also with different head groups that make them positively or negatively charged. What we also find are surface modifications like pedulations or even further modifications of the PEC chain like peptides or monoclonal antibodies. We have lipophilic APIs inside, we have non-exchangeable membrane dyes, and of course we find also cholesterol or other sterols in the membrane. And last but not least, of course, we have also hydrophilic APIs or mRNA encapsulated. So what you see here now is a very complicated multi-component mixtures. And the question arises now, what do we do for quality control or are there any quality issues? And indeed, there are specific quality issues in phospholipid-based nanocarriers. A small percentile, so 19% is based on the manufacturing. Then we have 70% of the quality issues that could arise in the stability. We have problems 6% approximately for the composition. We have a big part that is based on the characterization and the specifications. And of course, we have problems with the control of the drug product and the excipient. Now, if we sum up the stability, the composition, the control of the drug product and the excipients into a small part of the characterization and the specifications, we end up to 40 to 50% of all issues that could be addressed by means of a quantitative lipid analysis. And of course, also could be solved by the help of a quantitative lipid analysis. And now I would like to show you which possible approaches exist to quantify lipids or phospholipids. The oldest approaches on the market or has been introduced are colorimetric assays. The first colorimetric assay is the Bartlett assay. It was developed in 1959. Here, the normal phospholipid is treated with perchloric acid for 30 minutes at 180 degrees to generate an inorganic phosphate. This inorganic phosphate is then further reacted with 4 amino 2 naphthyl 4 sulfonic acid and ammonium molybdate tetrahydrate. And in the end, it forms a complex that can be measured spectrophotomatically at a wavelength of 830 nanometer. A bit newer is the Stewart assay. It was developed in 1980. Here we have the big advantage. We do not need um, the derivatization to an inorganic phosphate anymore. We just take the phospholipid, let it react with ammonium ferrothiocyanate that forms a complex that is 
soluble in chloroform. The pure agent here, the color reagent, is not soluble in chloroform. So we just measure then a chloroform soluble complex that can be then quantified spectroformatically at 470 nanometer. Of course, there are other kits available, but in the end, they do exactly the same what I've described here. So now let's have a look at the pros and the cons of colorimetric acid. A big pro is it's relatively easy to perform and we need a limited instrumentation. We need a spectrophotometer or a plate reader and then this quantification can be done. What is a big contra? I've already mentioned it, derivatization. Derivatization is always a problem because we have inter-user variability or even day-to-day -day variability which means there is a high error rate that can be over or underestimated. And in the end, no automatization of this technique is possible. Another problem is for the barbellet assay, there is the detection of inorganic phosphate. That means inorganic phosphate is also contained in buffer. That means we are forced to work in phosphate-free buffer, which is a huge limitation for the development of drug delivery systems. And for the Stewart assay, we can only detect organic phosphate. And here we have to be careful with every molecule that contains an organic phosphate like DNA, RNA, or specific enzymes. All in all, phospholipid quantification is more or less possible, but we cannot distinguish between charged and non-charged phospholipids. And of course, surface modifications or other APIs cannot be detected. The next technique that I would like to show you is the gas chromatography. In the gas chromatography, we take our um, nanocarrier, dissolve it in methanol to obtain the single components. Then the single components are further treated with sodium hydroxide for a so-called process of volatilization. That means we cleave here the ester bound, let it react with the methanol to form a fatty acid methyl ether. And this fatty acid methyl ether can be after a purification step with chloroform or any other organic solvent injected into the gas chromatography system and by the help of several detectors later quantified. Also here I would like to show you which are the pros and the cons. Pros, we can see the exact composition of the fatty acids in our lipids. It's perfect for the quality control before forming the uh, nanocarrier. That means quality control of single excipients is perfect. And depending on the method development, of course, but we will have fast methods and can have a results within less than 10 minutes. A big contra is also here, I mentioned it already for the colorimetric assays, we have the derivatization, which then always uh, lead to problems with the yield or the error rate. And also here, automatization can cause problems. And the next problem is that we have the differentiation of multi-component mixtures is not really possible since we just measure the fatty acid chains. And we also need here specific equipment and specific equipment is always expensive. And with this exp uh, specific equipment, we also have to do a method development which can be time consuming. Let's have a look here at the components. Phospholipids can be quantified, but just the fatty acids we can also measure cholesterol, but for the others, it's not possible. The next step to detect more or less everything is the high performance liquid chromatography or the ultra high performance liquid chromatography. Here we take our nanocarrier, dissolve it also in methanol to um, get the single components. And after a dilution step, they can then be um, injected into an HPLC or UHPL system and by the help of specific detectors, then later quantified. Here, I would like to give you an overview about the detectors that are um, existing on the market. Of course, the gold standard at the moment is the mass spectrometer. Here, we can quantify and also qualify our agent, but the big drawback for an MS, it's, it's super expensive, and you need a very well-trained person to handle this kind of instrument. The next detector that is uh, included in nearly every HPLC system is the diode array detector. Here we are limited to um, substances that have a chromophore. We can also use this for lipid detection, but only when they have a double bond. Then we have the refractive index detector, which is in principle relatively nice because it measures changes in the refractive index and therefore we can also measure lipids. But the problem is for the separation of the lipids with the high performance liquid chromatography, we need mostly a gradient method and the gradient induces always a change 
in the refractive index, therefore the refractive index detector is not really suitable for methods that have um, changes. The next three detectors, the so-called general detectors composed of the evaporative light scattering detector, the condensation nucleation light scattering detector, and the charge aerosol detector can be perfectly used for the analysis of lipids. And they measure just the charge of the component after the evaporation of the solvent. I will explain you later with the cut detector how they directly work, but now I would like to show you the general pros and cons of the method. A big pro is the exact composition, of course, depending on the method, is detectable. We can get a full resolution of all different components that are included in our nanocarrion or lipid system. We don't need any derivatization. We have a fast instrumental analysis, at least for the QHPLC, for less than 20 minutes, it's possible. And of course, also depending on the method, a big contra also here, we need specific equipment and also a probably time consuming method development. But once everything is correctly developed, we can measure all the different phospholipids and even distinguish between different fatty acid containing phospholipids. We can measure positively and negatively charged phospholipids. We measure lipid APIs or cholesterol. We can also see the modification or the pegulation or even conjugation to a peptide, it's going to be just complicated if there is a monoclonal antibody or another protein because they can precipitate in the methanol that is necessary to dissolve um, the carrier. And what is also possible to detect are hydrophilic APIs and mRNA and everything of that can be done simultaneously. After having introduced now all the different principles for lipid quantification, I would like to show you the practical approach, or I would like to show you our method that we have used, and our method is based on a new HPLC diode array detector charged aerosol detector, and we have used it for the analysis of phospholipid-based drug delivery systems. I would like to show you our analytical system that we have used. We have a new HPLC with the maximum pressure of 620 bar that was then further connected to a diode array detector, which was then further connected to a charged aerosol detector. And now I would like to explain you how these three detectors work. So the charged aerosol detector, evaporated light scattering detector. So these detectors are usually connected to a nitrogen source. This nitrogen goes into the nebulizing chamber and is then combined with the separated um, analytes in the alloyant coming also in a nebulizing chamber. Here, it's evaporated, the solvent and uh, dried particle remains. This remaining dried particle then is sent to the so-called charge transfer chamber, is char positively charged by an ionizer, then goes through an ion trap in a collector and electrometer, which basically measures the electric current of the particle uh, ionization and then and translates it into a signal that can be obtained by the computer to quantify all the different lipid signals. Our direct method was composed of three different uh, solvents. The first solvents that we have used was acetonitrile with 0.2% of tree fluor acetic acid. The second one was methanol and the third one was ultra pure water. These three solvents were sent into an 8U HPLC column as a reversed phase C18 column with a size of 150 to 2.1 millimeter. And we used um, a particle size of 1.9 micrometer. Our column over temperature was 50 degrees and we have chosen a flow rate of 0.7 millimeter per minute, which then reached the maximum pressure of our instrument. The injection volume of the sample was always five microliter and we used the gradient that is displayed here in this table. This means one analysis was shorter than 25 minutes. Now, from the analytical system to the results, and here is the first part of our results, we could detect neutral phosphatidylcholines, phosphatidylethanol that was further modified with um, polyethylene glycol and also cholesterol. And what is very nice here, we were able to distinguish between d palmitoyl phosphatidylcholine, palmitoyl oleoyl phosphatidylcholine, and d oleoyl phosphatidylcholine. They differ just in one double bond or in one carbon, and we were able to perfectly separate them from each other. We were also able to detect natural mixers like 
soy phosphatidylcholine, egg phosphatidylcholine, egg sphingomyelin, or uh, the hydrogenated soy phosphatidylcholine and its single components that were included in this mixture. Back from the neutral phosphatidylcholines, we could also measure negatively, phos uh, phosphatidyl, um, negatively phospholipids. And here we have the phosphatic acid or even mannose pack modified phosphatic acid head groups. We could also measure negatively charged phosphatidylglycerol, phosphatidylserine. And last but not least, we were also able to measure the non-exchangeable membrane dyes like DIO and DID. They could be measured with a DID detector and of course also with the cut detector. And there was one thing that is also very nice. We could not only measure the lipid species that are included in our mixture, we could also measure probably uh, the, the probably occurring degradation products that can occur after long-term storage, like palmitic acid, oleic acid, and steric acid. After having the results, it's very important to validate the method, and therefore we have chosen a validation based on the ICH Q2A guideline given from the FDA, and they would like to see a good linearity, a reproducibility, accuracy, limit of detection, and robustness. I would like to start here with the linearity and reproducibility. Of course, I've just chosen one example. Otherwise, if I would do it for every component that we have tested, I would bother you forever. And here you can see that we have perfect linear results in the range of 100 from 0 to 100 microgram. And we uh, reproduced the results five times, and every time we had a nice reproducibility and linearity. For the accuracy, we had the maximum deviation from the nominal concentration of less than 5%, which fulfilled completely the criteria. The sensitivity was the limit of detection was 500 nanograms per milliliter, and the limit of quantification was 2.5 microgram per milliliter, which is more than enough for a regular. Um, lipid quantification of uh, phospholipid-based nanocarriers. And of course, the robustness. And the robustness means the uh, we tested the analytical separation in modified conditions. And here you can see we changed a little bit the temperature of the column oven. We changed, uh, we changed the um, flow rate. And we changed also the evaporation temperature of the charged aerosol detector. And as you can see, all the changes did not induce any change in the separation. That means the method is robust enough to be transferred to another instrument and, of course, to be transferred to another lab. After having the first results and the method validation, we went on with the performance validation. And the first performance validation we did was by means of a Bupivaca in formulation. We have taken this Bupivaca in formulation did the production and tested the lipid concentration and the molar ratio of the lipid concentration after every production step. So we had it before the extrusion, we had it after the extrusion, we did it during the gradient building, after the loading of the bupivacaine into the formulation, and of course we tested the final drug delivery system. And as you can see, there were no changes in the molar ratio, so no significant, statistically significant changes of the molar ratio. But what we could see, of course, this is a well-known phenomenon. After the extrusion, we lost approximately 10% of the overall lipid concentration. But also, this could be avoided by a one-step process, and it doesn't directly interfere with our analytical method. The second performance validation was with the market product. We have taken Doxil. Doxil is the doxyrubicin formulation that was introduced into the market in 1995. And as you can see here, we are perfectly able to separate all the components that are included in this formulation. Um, we have here our internal standard and the components of cholesterol, HSPC, the pegulated DSPE, and the other part of the HSPC. And as you can see here in the bar diagram, this is the theoretical molar content um, based on the publication from Professor Barenholz and our formulation with our analytical technique was tested before and after, and we obtained the same um, concentration. That means our method is perfectly suitable to analyze um, samples that came from the research and also from the are, are actually on the market. The last thing that we tested was a stability evaluation. I've already mentioned that we wanted to see the degradation products. Therefore, we took our Bupivacaine formulation and 
put it into a forced degradation. Therefore, we have tested it in a UVA cube for 36 hours and measured then the lipid concentration and the molar ratio. And as you can see here, after the treatment of 18 hours and 36 hours, we could see that the lipid was degraded. We could also see it in the chromatogram that it was degraded and we could directly see which lipid degraded in which concentration. That brings me all in all to the summary. And this means we are able to simultaneously detect natural phospholipids, synthetic phospholipids, or charged synthetic phospholipids. We could detect simultaneously PEC modified lipids, sterols, non exchangeable fluorescent lipid markers, and if necessary, also their degradation products. All in all, this is a simple and fast sample preparation. We get results in less than 25 minutes. And of course, a modification of this method is always possible for using it for a specific API detection or even for mRNA detection. At the end, I would like to thank Professor Paolo Luciani, Dr. Lisa Ranfeld, and Dr. Simona Alejandri, and of course, the Group for Pharmaceutical Technology at the University of Bern. Thank you very much. Thank you once again to Florian. Thanks to everyone um, who joined us today. And we uh, very much look forward to seeing you in a, a few minutes at our Genetic Medicine Evolution Revolution webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone.